So my name is Jason Norman, and I am the uh, I'm Programs and Events Coordinator at the Writers Guild of Alberta, and uh, we're partnering uh, on this event with uh, with the Edmonton Arts Council. And I thank David very much for for uh, for hosting this and uh, helping uh, it get off the ground kind of pretty quickly. Um, so uh, it was something that I thought maybe we could have a a, a, a discussion while the the kind of the fire in the belly was still hot. So uh, we, we went with that. So uh, thanks again to everybody that's here. Um, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory uh, and we respect the histories, languages and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. And I will introduce everybody to uh, my guests today. Um, that are going to help us with this discussion. So first up, we have Matt Bowes. Matt Bowes is the general manager of New West Press here in Edmonton. After receiving a degree in English literature from the University of Alberta, Matt Bowes has worked in the publishing industry for 14 years, first as a comic book store manager, then at New West Press starting in 2012. An avid film fan, he co-hosts Bollywood is for Lovers, a bi-weekly podcast on Hindi cinema, Hindi cinema. He also presented two film series at Edmonton's Metro Cinema Society, a monthly series comparing comic books and film called Graphic Content, and a re retrospective on outlaw filmmaker Seijun Suzuki. His critical writing has appeared at The Pulp, Sequential Tart, and Luma Quarterly. Hi, Matt. Hello, how are you? I'm good. Thank you. And uh, Ann Pasek. Um, Ann Pasek is the Canada Re Research Chair in Media, Culture, and the Environment, and an assistant professor cross appointed between the Department of Cultural Studies and the School of the Environment at Trent University, I believe. She studies the cultural politics of climate change, focusing in particular on how carbon becomes mediated and meaningful in different institutional and social contexts. As an energy humanist, she further investigates the connection between research methods, academic norms, and carbon intensity, developing and prototyping low carbon alternatives for conducting research and sustaining collegial connections. How'd I do there? You did great. Um, thanks so much for having me. And you're a, you're a Edmontonian, former Edmontonian. Yeah, born and raised. Born and um, raised here. Yeah, I, I, my first degree was McEwen. My second degree was the U of A. It's still very much where my heart is. Um, well, we're uh, we're happy to have you. You you come uh, highly recommended from Edmontonians. So, uh, thank you for for joining us and uh, and helping with this discussion. So, um, for everybody that is um, watching and who read about what this panel, uh, the way we tried to describe this panel, um, there when we when you say the word crypto these days, there's a lot of different paths and rabbit holes that we can go down. Um, one of the things that I wanted to make sure that we do is we're, we're going to be relating this to the art sector, but also mostly the, the kind of the literature community in, in Canada, but also, of course, Edmonton. We want to know how this all relates to us and um, the environment, uh, the environmental impact of the discussions that um, things like crypto and crypto mining um, bring up. Uh, I would love to hear questions at some point after we go for a while. So you can do that in any way that you want. You could put the raise your hand function or, or type them in the chat and, uh, and we'll get to them, uh, you know, if they come in. Um, so the first, the first thing I wanted to do was just lay out just a couple of the terms. I am not an expert in basically anything in the world, except for like, uh, Fortnite dances, I guess I could do. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so if, if, if anybody has a better definition of some of the things I'm going to lay out, uh, you know, please, you could correct me or, but we're just going to try to get, uh, to, to a starting point. So when we talk about cryptocurrency, what we're talking about is, is digital currency, basically that, um, is mined, um, through, uh, energy use via like supercomputers and also just regular computers. Things like Bitcoin, everybody has probably heard about. Another thing we're going to be talking about um, is Ethereum. These are two digital currencies, two cryptocurrencies. And the blockchain is how this information is stored and how transactions occur. The blockchain is 
exists through the work of these computers that do complex mathematical equations to create blocks. Uh, the blockchain itself is basically a digital ledger system, file keeping system, instead of it being stored in a centralized location like a bank or government. Um, it is kind of stored uh, between peer to peer uh, networks. Um, and that's why uh, a lot of people like it so much is the decentralized nature of it. Crypto uh, to the, the miners that uh, mine cryptocurrency do so to create blocks in the blockchain. They are rewarded when they create a block by receiving a piece of that digital currency, which is sometimes worth a lot of money and sometimes not worth a lot of money. But the one thing that is um, uh, for sure is that it takes a lot of energy and electricity usage. Um, and then the last thing I will say is an NFT. Uh, we'll be talking about NFTs, a non-fungible token. Basically, an NFT is a digital product that is created, um, and it is a unique uh, item. And it is the information about the item is kept through the possibility or the the uh, opportunity that the blockchain uh, provides for it. So, uh, information like who created the piece of digital media or digital art or digital photograph. Um, that information is stored based, and also if people buy or trade the token, um, all of that information is, is uh, stored on the blockchain. Um, so we'll be, we'll be talking about these NFTs, this kind of digital, um, digital currency, but also digital products or items um, down, the, down the road. And uh, for everybody that's still awake, um, so well, I'm gonna start with Matt. Uh, so Matt, you are, um, you work for, you're the general manager for a publisher here in Edmonton. I don't know how many books you publish per year, uh, or how many books you've published since you, you started working at, um, New West, but I wanted to just ask first, what did you know about how your specific company or how the publishing industry in general was talking about its carbon footprint? climate change and kind of it's it's um the effect that it was having on kind of greenhouse gas emissions at the time when you started and maybe versus you know right now sure uh to answer your first question uh between 100 and 110 books i've published uh depends if you count compilations of book as a book we've done a few of those but uh yeah we do 10 to 12 a year and uh, I've been present for 10 of those, so easy. Um, with regards to sort of the carbon usage uh, that uh, publishing uses, I guess we kind of, since I started at New West, we've been using like environmentally friendly paper. So it's Enviro. You can always find that on your printer's quote that you want it to be printed on Enviro. So we thought that that was good, good start at least. Um, and one of the things that I did in 2012, when I started at New West, I wasn't the manager then, but I really uh, pushed to learn about the ebook marketplace and how we can sort of take control of our distribution of ebooks and what is an ebook. Like I learned all about that. Um, and yeah, that's sort of the intersection there that what I learned about is kind of the printing and then ebooks. So digital books, right? That's kind of where I started in 2012. And then I attended a really good session that the Association of Canadian Publishers put on. Okay, so time is moving very slowly, but also fast at the same time now during the pandemic. So I believe it was two years ago, but it may have been one year ago on uh, sustainability practices in the publishing sector. So that we, you know, we talked about um, carbon emissions and doing offsets, which uh, the last time I flew in a plane for a really long time was to Frankfurt in 2019 when I purchased an offset. I think uh, offsets are kind of a salve for this kind of thing. It kind of just makes you more feel more better than anything. I don't know if they really uh, are what they're cracked up to be. I think I purchased some a stake in a wind farm in Turkey or something. There's like a marketplace that you're, you know, so I felt a little bit better about that. But 
yeah uh most of the time i'd rather be on the phone or zoom honestly i i, I like zoom meetings i think that uh that's a way that uh, my company especially has kind of cut down on our missions. Uh, we used to have in-person board meetings for a nonprofit and we would uh, fly some board members in, put them up in our houses and stuff, but I would be per perfectly happy to do those meetings for Zoom over the rest of my life just because uh, carbon and also you don't have to order people coffee and get a room and stuff. They can just do it themselves. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy letting my board members do that. Uh, but. Yeah, uh, really, I think 2021 is when most people became uh, familiar with the concept of an NFT. Uh, really, the thing that shot NFTs in the foot off the hop was the dumb name. Uh, it may be like accurate, but the, most people don't tend to think about the fungibility of uh, things that they own. So uh, I think that kind of put people off right away. And um with regards to NFTs and literature, I mean, we all kind of talked about it two weeks ago with uh, Todd Babiak selling the first uh, NFT to uh, a man who lives in town in Edmonton, and then he uh, gave access to it through the uh, Edmonton Public Library. So that was kind of the impetus for me to think a little bit about, well, what would an NFT book, what, what uh, solution does that pose? what problem is out there that this is fixing? Because I don't yes. necessarily think I know of one. Uh, well, I this, think there's ways that we could do this that are less carbon intensive and less sort of fad-ish, I guess. No, this is great. And you got a bunch of steps ahead of me already. So it's perfect because um, those are some of the things that I'm going to ask you in, in, a, in a couple minutes. Um, and the, the, the one thing I wanted to, to start with you about was, so... Um, Matt just mentioned this. So um, Edmonton author Todd Babiak um, in the, uh, wrote a book. Basically, he created it as an, an, as an NFT, and they auctioned it um, on an Ethereum site, I think OpenSea or one of the – it's a site where you can purchase um, these NFTs, these digital um, things. And um, what he did was – I think he talked about how he was going to do this um, before he – did it and then and uh so he, people were kind of thinking about it because he's obviously um enthusiastic about about that world and uh so basically what he did was he wrote the book he uh lives in tasmania right now which is a a place where um i don't think all of australia is like this but in tasmania there, it's a carbon neutral um part of the world um, and there was some offsets in terms of gas usage to heat or cool or whatever his his home while he wrote the book. Uh, and he kind of took an estimate on that based on how long uh, it, it took him to write the book. And then he auctioned this off. And I think it's it was it's obviously uh, um, I think we looked this up before. I think it was purchased for two Ethereum, which is about eight thousand dollars Canadian. Um, and so this was this was announced in Edmonton to a lot of kind of media excitement. This is the first one. Um, and because it was purchased by a, a, an also an Edmonton businessman, he then owned the NFT, which means that he owned the digital form of this book, this novel. And uh, then he donated it to the, the Edmonton Public Library so that the library could then create multiple copies of the ebook to, to then share. So when the news was announced, there was a lot of writers, there was a lot of kind of Twitter buzz about, hey, by the way, um, being carbon neutral while you're writing your book is nice, but uh, cryptocurrency uses a ton of energy. And this is not as clean as you think it is. And is anybody gonna talk about this? And also, why are we all screaming? <laughs> so in terms of what you study, is this even just kind of the beginning when you talk about culture and how we're just even reacting to carbon and how carbon is used either in our name or in art's name is this kind of where a, some of your studies kind of take you is in conversations like this absolutely yeah so i'll, I'll take a, a really long view at first and just say that um I, I think part of what we're seeing here in this conversation is the repetition of a really long pattern right whenever there is a new technology there's often a kind of social panic that that comes with it um, because, you know, sometimes there are genuine social changes and disruptions and people, you know, have, have reactions to it or sincerely held political disagreements with uh, the, the sort of offering 
of, of the day, um, but also just because it's new and weird. So I think it's new and weird. And, and one of the ways in which that alarm is being focalized is through the environment. Um, but it's also not a, a bad faith kind of concern to be walking around with, right? Like uh, as the person who's professionally freaked out about climate change, I'm, I'm glad to see people, um, you know, have that kind of awareness. Um, so yeah, I did a bit of a bit of digging, and uh, um, I, I, I want to kind of um, hold true to my community of researchers here and try to communicate that um, there's both a great deal of uncertainty about the precise carbon output of uh, any given action of an individual artist or author uh, minting or selling things on on Ethereum and other crypto chains. Um, but there, there's like across that uncertainty, some like broad principles that we can kind of hold to be true. Um, so the debate is like really like, you know, uh, footprinting any global industry, certainly a globally distributed industry of people who are very secret is gonna, gonna have some tricks to it. We're, we're not gonna really like one and done this. Um, so the debate tends to be what small nation state is Bitcoin and Ethereum roughly comparable to? And we could have a really geeky, uninteresting conversation if it's more like Jordan or if it's more like Argentina in terms of its profile. Um, but it is like broadly a lot of electricity flowing through a lot of computers around the world, um, often in parts of the world where those grids uh, have pretty, pretty carbon intensive energy on them. Um, so, you know, uh, someone did a, a quick calculation and, and, and one guess on the table is that minting one F NFT produces about 90 uh, kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents. So that's roughly the same as like an hour of a, a transatlantic flight. Um, so it's not terrible, but it is substantial. And if you're doing tons and tons of this, and if this industry really takes off, then we're looking at, um, you know, a kind of exponential growth situation that we we can't really afford when we're really trying to bend that curve in the other direction. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and just to put out another figure to sort of hold these in better comparison, um, I, I found one study that suggested that the carbon footprint of printing a single paperback is about three kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent. So 90 kilograms, three kilograms, we're sort of dealing with differences in, in scale in a meaningful way. And, you know, the size of those markets are going to be different. The future and enjoyment of these assets, physical and digital, you know, pull in different directions. I think these are really interesting social questions to explore, right? Like what this kind of work does, how its audiences are different, how its social function changes. Um, but just from a, a strict carbon accounting perspective, to the extent that we have that picture, um, we can see that, you know, it, it is a kind of apple and orange in, in a way. And um, I will also say, so there's a couple things. Um, just, you know, I will tell everybody, if you just Google stuff, like it's super, it's super fun. Um, you don't have to put any code words into the internet, like just type what's the deal with cryptocurrency and then Google will tell you things. So to, without being too wonky, Bitcoin is the one that people know about a lot. Bitcoin uses a something called uh, proof of work um, to create the blocks that go in the blockchain and a block is created every 10 minutes. And proof of work basically means all of these supercomputers uh, in these uh, crypto mines are working very hard to solve an equation that can verify a transaction. And then uh, a lot of more so supercomputers are then competing to then verify whether that math is actually correct or not. And that takes uh, a ton of energy because it's like, there's just millions in, of things going on. Um, also like two thirds of the world's crypto mines, maybe at one point we're coming from China or parts in, in that uh, in the world there where they get basically all of their energy from burning coal, which is bad. Uh, we also burn coal, which is bad. Burning coal is bad, probably. But uh, Ethereum is uh, uses a different process for their proof of work that actually uses quite a, a, a lot less energy than Bitcoin. Um, basically, the way that somebody explained it to me was that to mine Bitcoin, you need a very a sophisticated and powerful computer to mine Ethereum. You could use something with a like a, a gaming laptop or something with a with a graphics card. So you could do that at your house, and you wouldn't need massive servers and things like that. 
also, um, as was mentioned in the in the conversation that we had when there was a big uproar about the carbon footprint of uh, NFTs and, and cryptocurrency, Ethereum has been working on, I don't know for how long, but they're working on something called uh, to verify their transactions called proof of stake instead of proof of work, which means proof of stake means that instead of spending energy to verify an equation, what you do is you stake uh, an amount of cryptocurrency on the fact that you will get that equation right, or that that equation that equation is verified. And if you are, if it turns out that you're wrong, if you basically let something, a transaction occur that is uh, fraudulent or just wrong in any way, you, you it's possible that you lose your stake. You will lose that amount of uh, Bitcoin or uh, the amount, I guess, of Ethereum in this case that you uh, you staked to to guarantee that this was right. This would apparently re re reduce the carbon footprint by like 99% of uh, how much Ethereum. And they, the, even Todd Babbick himself said that Ethereum was going to be carbon neutral soon. So there is that. It is a lot cleaner than, than, than Bitcoin, which is interesting, just in terms of just how they kind of get their uh, stuff. Um, so... Um, then that made me, of course, lose my train of thought because I was just talking about stuff for so long. But I'll, I'm will i going to come back to you. Go ahead. I can jump in there. Go so, ahead. Um, yeah, I one of the, the people that I study in my capacity as a professor is this startup that's trying to create um, carbon removal tokens that runs on Ethereum. And so I remember in like 2018 being in Seattle um, and people in the back of the room like raised their hands saying like, you know, you want to solve climate change, but you're creating the problem by being on Ethereum. And the answer in 2018 was that very soon, Ethereum is going to change to be on proof of stake. And it's sort of, you know, um, a suspicious, ironic kind of turn that that's still the case today. I think for, for many, many years, this has sort of been the environmental promise, um, but it hasn't panned out. And um, it, it is true that Ethereum is a little bit lighter than Bitcoin, but it's sort of at its present level, uh, just to play the, the role of the, again, professionally forget about climate change person. Um, I'm still kind of kind of worried there. Um, one, one set of figures that we have to compare Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, they're on the higher end of estimates, so take it with a grain of salt. But um, to the energy required to compute a single transaction on the network, so one sort of round of mining those blocks, um, for Bitcoin takes uh, the energy equivalent of running a home for 73 days for a single transaction. And then for Ethereum, the energy equivalent of running your home for nine days. Um, so dramatically different, but also like we, that that's a lot of energy put towards a very inefficient system. Um, inefficient because it wants to be resilient, it wants to be decentralized, it wants to be trustless. Um, but you know, those are those are values that don't always match to you know the values of people on the, the, the chain. So it would be interesting to see if improvements could be made, um, but we can't assume that they will come um, finally after you know many continued years of this promise being put out there. Well, it is interesting, and I know that was one of the criticisms is that they've been kind of touting proof of stake for for a long time. Um, so the the there's a uh, you were reading the figures right from where I had them. I had those exact numbers in terms of um, a single Bitcoin transaction is also the equivalent of 2.6 million Visa transactions. Um, and then eth Ethereum is um, th um, 330,000 Visa transactions or 25,000 hours of watching YouTube. So um, Matt, I also was looking at um, the uh, a table of basically the carbon emissions of planet Earth per year. And um, once again, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a professor, but basically two third or no, three quarters of uh, carbon emissions in the world are basically spent on basically powering things, heating and, and electricity. Um, but according to our world in data, this, the, uh, this site, 0.6% um, of the global emissions per year come from turning pulp into paper, um, which is compared to kind of what Anne was saying about, I think the, the 
um, Bitcoin, uh, or not just Bitcoin, I think all cryptocurrency contributes to about 1% roughly. Um, and if you add Ethereum and Bitcoin together, it's basically like the, the carbon contributions of like England, I think we're at, but it's true. We could just name countries. Um, one is the Netherlands, sometimes it's Belgium. Um, but like adding a country in, in some ways doesn't feel like, um, I, I'm just thinking about, um, you know, 0 0.6, does that even, does that surprise you? Does that seem high? Does that seem low in terms of like turning, it's not just turning pulp into novels. It's turning it yeah. into all, it, it's turning it into all paper. Um, um, I think trans I, I, I wouldn't say that's surprising um, because uh, something, a, a minor crisis going on in the background of book publishing right now is that paper uh, costs are rising and it actually is due to a number of factors, but uh, one of them being that uh, with everyone stuck at home and using e-commerce all day long, the paper mills have moved towards making uh, like uh, cardboard boxes and sort of like rougher paper that you use to package things. So we could see that on our end in that the stuff that we use to make the books is becoming more expensive because it's being made less. And just think about how many things are purchased in copper boxes, right? Like it's um, many people have something coming in every day. If you have Amazon Prime or something, horrible company, by the way. But uh, if you have Amazon, you could you know, remember those little buttons they had like, oh, I need Tide delivered to me every time I press this button. Um, that sort of just on time uh, delivery is fairly carbon intensive. Um, I would. Uh, <laughs> One of my fallbacks with the, the publishing world is that, unfortunately, um, the amount of uh, resources and money spent on uh, buying books and also on producing them, is kind of a drop in the bucket because I wish it was higher. I wish we would <laughs> have much more higher printing costs because we printed so many books that we, and we had 300,000 Visa transactions that were used to purchase them. That'd be great. But uh, yeah, you know, uh, I think there's ways that uh, the publishing industry can try to decarbonize itself. Um, a lot of it could be done through, uh, you know, minimizing initial print runs, uh, telling granting agencies that, by the way, too, because they want you to do, uh, you know, a minimum that's potentially higher than it could be a lot of the time. Um, and then also moving to ebooks, which you know, I am more comfortable buying an ebook from, say, an English publisher than I am from uh, buying the print version, right? Like, I'd rather uh, spend that little bit of electricity and a little bit of carbon on that transaction rather than the print book flying to me or being on a boat or something. So, I think that's a way that we have been able to decarbonize our, uh, decarbonize ourselves a little. But yeah, it's it's obviously going to be an issue for this industry. So the 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 one thing I wanted to ask, and so I have this, I think you can see this, right? This chart. There. So, um, and I'll bring up some of the criticisms that that were that came up during our conversation a couple of weeks ago. But if you bring road transportation into it, that's about 12%. So that's the bringing the book, books to the stores. But once again, 12% is all road transportation. It's not just, so it's like, if you're just thinking about what the, the book industry um, does, but I guess so that the 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 question I have for Anne is so what we're the one thing that comes up is um, I'm talking to Matt and we were going to have a bookstore owner that was going to join us but basically the idea is every book that he's ever published or every book that's sitting in a bookstore right now represents uh, a certain carbon footprint and you you reference that at the beginning um and then we're, we're, we're kind of sitting back on a little bit is, well, A, it's just a drop in the bucket, but also there's this kind of greater good. It's for, it's for the culture, it's jobs, it's other things like that. And then the, the, the other thing I keep hearing a lot when, when it comes to the criticisms about cryptocurrency mining are right now, they're calling it a 21st century technology that's being powered by a 19th century or 20th century technology. And so they're basically saying, you know, the future, the future is going to cost you to get there because we don't have the powerful enough means to create our energy through wind and high, uh, solar and um, the one that comes from the ground, the uh, geothermal. So is are, are these the types of 
I'm thinking about, especially when we talk about Todd Babiak, we're, you know, when he comes up, I like to think about branding a lot. I like to think about how people tell the story about where things come from. And I'm think I'm thinking if that, also comes into the things that you study as well. Like when I hear that, is that just a throwaway term when they say, oh, well, we're powering 21st century technology with 20th century technology. Does that actually mean something? And also, you know, when I, when Matt and I are talking about the drop in a bucket for one novel or one bookstore in Edmonton, you know, are we also having the right conversation there? Or, sh or do we need to kind of squeeze everything we can out of, you know, every person when it comes to trying to do what we can to reduce this footprint? Yes, um, I think I have maybe three different responses. We'll see if I can remember them all. So all um, three of my, all three of my, my questions. <laughs> but um, I, I'm really glad you showed that graph because I think it, it communicates a, a really key part to the puzzle of climate mitigation, which is that there, there really is no silver bullet um, obvious enemy where we, we can focus all of our ire defeat it and solve the problem, right? Energy makes up a huge part of that wedge, but that's just because energy takes many different forms. It's liquid hydrocarbons, it's hydropower, um, you know, it's solar and batteries or batteries made of salt, right? Like, uh, and, and, and so when you think about, you know, where you wanna focus your energy, what, what we really need to, you know, hit with all of our social power, um, it's kind of diffuse, it's everywhere, right? So one of the tricks of climate politics is um, trying to find some way to hold everything in your head at the same time, right? Like it's it's going to be the case that every single industry kind of has to do its part. We can't just, you know, rely on fixing the transportation problem and then fixing everything. Um, or even just decarbonizing electricity because we need to electrify more things, right? Um, we need to get all of our cars into batteries that are powered from grids that draw from green power and that power is going to be intermittent. So we've got to, you know, find ways to load share and then also dramatically reduce load, right, to, to, to be able to bring everything into that sort of green fellowship of, of electrons. So there's, there's no free lunch. There's no easy way. Um, the trick is just to find, um, you know, proportionate ways of, of living with those challenges. Right. So, you know, for for Matt, I, I, I'm really glad that this is a, a thing that's showing up in your industry that people care about and are working on. And I think like you're on the right track. It, it's finding what the solutions are for the industry and then maybe, you know, some sort of target that that you can you know move on year by year by year to kind of get yourself down to zero. Um, so, too, for major oil companies. So, too, for, you know, um, uh, cement factories. Um, and, you know, hopefully at the end of the day, those oil companies look pretty dramatically different than they do at present, um, but so too many, many kinds of industries, right? Um, it's just to say that, like, even if we're talking about 1% of the problem, that 1% still needs to change if we're going to really hold things under control, because we, we really desperately do need every single bit of, of point of traction on this thing. Um, we've, we've got a wretched, wretched track record for the past couple of decades. Um, so that's that's one thing. Um, the second thing is they're rapidly fading from memory. Um, <laughs> oh, um, why is it the case that like the artists are suddenly like the face of this problem? I think that's a really, really interesting and, and important question to ask, right? Um, NFTs pre-exist the this you know little fad with with um, the art market that we've seen in the past couple of months. Um, blockchain certainly has been around for much longer, um, but there's something about um, art and artists as a kind of avant-garde figure, right, that, that sort of puts forward a proposition in a way that's often quite intentionally provocative, um, and branding can be one of the reasons to do that. Um, starting social conversations and sort of forcing ethical questions can be another, and so, you know, whatever the intention is, I think, like, Suddenly we're socially caring about this because art has made what is otherwise an esoteric, um, uh, maybe minimally interesting financial project to many. Um, it has a face, it has pictures. The pictures are bad. Uh, so let's talk about it, you know? Um, I, I, I think that's just kind of like the, the unlucky role of, of art in our society today to kind of be the focal point for those conversations. 
So for people who are kind of like in that light, um, you know, my sympathies, uh, I, I don't think it's 100% proportionate, the, the amount of attention that, you know, this is drawing versus your actions, but also that's kind of part of the role of art um, to, to bring that in, to have panels like this. <laughs> so I, that, that's great that you, you set that up because I want to ask Matt about, I want to talk a little bit about value, but also I think uh, and maybe we'll circle back, but the the one thing I wanted, to, I think you had a you had a theory on why art is entering the this conversation, especially spe specifically when it comes to NFTs and when it comes to cryptocurrency. Yeah, I think you know, uh, I think it's kind of just the cool thing to do right now. It's a way to get attention. It's a way to get the media to look at your project and say, oh wow. Uh, media figures who don't really have the time to dig into the history of these sort of projects can kind of say like, oh, NFT book, eh? That's kind of cool. Uh, when it's the idea of having an exclusivity uh, contract for a work of art is not new. Uh, think about Martin Shkreli. Do you remember that guy? In 2021, I believe, he bought the Wu-Tang album that was to be the only one ever made and then he you know he squirreled it away into his lair and then he went to jail but that's sort of like an, a non-fungible token is assuming he didn't copy it like it is a you know a printed non-fungible token and, and there's value there because people are interested in the Wu-Tang Clan they're a you know popular group for 30 years now I guess and people want to hear that uh, that album they they have a history with the uh, group so I guess the way that art is the the tip of the spear on this sort of thing, and you know this novel that uh, Todd Babiak has written, it's it is yeah making uh, tangible, fungible possibly no not really but like it it is major, making uh, into something that you you know and understand you you know you you typically don't look at your electricity bill and think like oh this is a this is a math problem I like to solve every month. But you know, look at a book; they're right there. And you know, is this an interesting new way of uh, uh, delivering books? Um, I, I said at the time that uh, the possibly more ethical and definitely better for the environment version of this would have been to just release the book in the Creative Commons, which uh, does not have the um, the downside of needing to be attached to a blockchain and Ethereum in order to uh, propagate this message, but. Uh, uh, the uh, the businessman who bought the book kind of did an exclusive contract with the university with the library. Sorry, so I mean it. it, it Creative Commons was uh, sexy and interesting twenty years ago when Cory Doctorow was releasing Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom as a as a Creative Commons novel, but it's kind of been eclipsed by the new technology, which is interesting and like fun to think about, I guess. But I don't know if it is really uh, a solution to a problem that exists. So I want to. I, I thought you were going to say your other theory, which was that um, people. I have that so own, many theories. Well, I, pe yeah, I people that people that own cryptocurrency, um, it only oh, has that one. Yeah. it only has value <laughs> when you trade it into money. Yes. Yes. Um, because most now more places are taking cryptocurrency as payment uh, for things like I think Tesla was back and forth with it, but the main point is that a lot of these people want to cash out, and yeah. you can't cash out if all the same traders are just waiting for it to keep increasing in value. This is, a, this is an entirely other conversation about kind of the ethical uh, weird ground that crypto operates in. But there, I just, I thought you were gonna say that, but I like that oh. answer too. But I wanna, I wanna to focus on the NFT part um, and because I don't wanna leave too many things out and I don't wanna keep uh, people forever like this is a lecture, but I think this is going well, I think. Um, so an NFT, you 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 uh, alluded to this. the The idea of an NFT is that one person owns it. Like, if I bought like I have this mug, but the but many mugs like this were made. Um, now, if it had like a serial number, I would know that that was one of whatever. But in the in the in the the life cycle of what uh, Todd Babiak did was. He created his book as an NFT and he's and he auctioned it off and he was paid in Ethereum, which I assume that he's he's gonna maybe hold on to it and see if it increases in value, or maybe he cashed it out or whatever. But the idea is that that owner then owns it 
and is um, most of the time going to hold on to it to see if it increases in value because the main part of its value is the fact that it cannot be copied. Um, but what he did instead was he donated it to the Edmonton Public Library so that everybody could uh, read the book. Um, but that also kind of then turns the thing not into an NFT anymore, it just, which is also kind of weird. Um, but uh, there's a couple, you know, Todd has, a, has some comments about why he did what he did, and he's definitely very excited about the crypto world. But um, I just want to talk about the, so the, the criticism was this is a glorified ebook with a larger carbon footprint than an actual ebook. I think that's, at least in terms of that, we could probably all agree that that is, that is the case. Matt, I don't know what it costs for you to make an ebook, um, but do you, do you want to talk about um, the, what you see as, usually you're saying a solution looking for a problem or a problem or, yeah. Sure. Um, well, I guess if I could tie it back to when I worked at a comic book store, do you remember when Superman died? The death of Superman? That yes. issue yes, that I everyone do. was told, you know, this is going to be worth a lot of money. Buy some copies, put it in your attic, and you'll be able to pay for your kid's college education. But they also printed like six million of them. So uh, I would often, when I work at the comic book store, people would come in and say, oh, I got, I got my death of Superman. It's been 30 years now. I'm in the money. Let me know. It's time. And they would say, how much is it worth? And what I would say is things are worth what people will pay for them. And uh, me, I will not pay you more than what it says on there. Dollar twenty-five, maybe. You know, I it it is not a uh, it is not an item of value. There was so many of them made, and it was essentially a scam to get people to buy a lot of these items. So, with the NFT thing, the exclusivity, um, we saw that uh, Chris Labos here, the man who purchased the book, he immediately made it available to the Edmonton Public Library, which. It, was being sort of touted as a very, um, a, a nice act to do, but also it's a book, right? You can read it once and then sit on it and maybe lend it to somebody who wants to get it. But like, it's not, it's not a formula for cold fusion. It's not a, um, it's not, you know, the nuclear secrets. The, the value of the book is that it can enlighten and entertain you. And, you know, the, the boss here wants to enlighten and entertain people through uh, giving the book out. But I would say that the, the, the value proposition here is really unclear to me because this is a very complicated sort of contract that is automatically done by algorithms that I don't know if a normal printing, uh, like publishing contract is worse in some respects. So it, like it's certainly not automatic like that, but um, things that come to mind when I think about this, this issue is uh, something that Canadian authors know and love is the uh, public lending right, where uh, if a library buys your book or your ebook, um, you, the author, just gets a check from the Canada Council, basically, because people read your book and enjoyed it. And it's sort of like seen as a social good that your, your work is out there. I don't know who gets the public lending right in this situation. I wonder if Chris Labossier, the owner of the book, would possibly be the one who would get it. Uh, the public lending right only caught up to audiobooks maybe five years ago. So this is probably a 20 year problem for them to uh, uh, figure out. But um, that's that's one question. That's that's well, a very that's, Canadian question though. That's, that's a weird one. Well, no, it's great that you, you're always a step ahead of me because I talked to Peter at the public lending rights office this week. Uh, because I had a couple questions about public lending rights. So for the writers in the audience, yes, Matt is right. If you have a book in a library anywhere in Canada, you should do that because then they give you money every year. I would like to one day be a part of the system. Um, it sounds sweet. Um, Matt, I, I don't I, so I don't want to rush anybody. I just don't want to I just I don't want to go forever on this. But I think publishers and libraries, have a very interesting relationship. And at times you kind of butt heads about the thing that you both care about a lot about. Um, most, e most books are made available as an ebook to libraries in very limited forms, usually three max, um, because they don't want, if there's a thousand people that want to read the latest so-and-so book, if a thousand people take it out as an ebook, those are a thousand people that aren't going to buy the book. But if some people are tired of waiting on hold or you know don't want to wait so long, they will then go buy the book. And that's kind of what publishers want, which is how they stay alive, which is how they pay 
writers to write the book. Todd's book, um, I looked it up, has unlimited copies available. I think they put a thousand, but probably because that's where the 999 probably ran out of room. The interesting thing about Todd's book is there aren't people on a waiting list for that one because as many people that want to read it can read it basically. So there's about 300 and some simultaneous um, people taking out that book at once, which is different than um, he, his, his own fiction that's also in the library because usually the publishers will only make one or two or three available. Um, so I was curious as, as whether this was a way to um, to work the system of, of public lending rights, which is that he could say, look how many copies are being taken out from the library. Um, and you're right, maybe it's Chris Labossiere that, that actually gets that uh, payment, which I don't think they probably worked that out. Um, the other thing about this contract that, they, so they, they call it a smart contract, which is basically tracked on the blockchain. So any kind of conditions that went into that, um, were made that way. And, and Todd says this was very easy and it takes way less time than regular contracts. And if we have time, I'm going to ask Matt about that. But there was there was some shots fired about contracts there. But uh, Public Lending Rights Office said it doesn't matter how many people take out the book. It just matters um, whether the book is available. And it's really about how many libraries the book is available in and not how many people take the book out. I don't think they even have a way of tracking that, to be honest. But um, they were very interested in uh, in this question because if it ever changes, then um, you know this can be a way of of not to say this is this is a whole this is a scam on the Canadian government. We could talk about we don't have time to talk about any scams at all, but um, it was it was a question to be asked because the, that is something that's very important to authors. The the I don't want to leave Anne out of this conversation too long, but the, this is the interesting thing about this whole process is that Todd wrote this book for X amount of money and that's it. Um, the idea that this book is then donated. Oh, go ahead. I think technically any future transactions that the book is involved in on the blockchain, he does get a cut of that going forward. So he does kind of have a royalty involved in it, but that's assuming that uh, Chris Labossier sells it to someone else. Like as the progenitor of the artwork, uh, uh, Todd is entitled to a certain amount, but um, if it's going to be available for free, like, you know, it's the, the thing about uh, why go out for milk when you got a cow at home, right? Well, it, I guess it, if they, if they want to, I mean, you would think, I mean, maybe the foreign language rights belong to somebody, maybe, I mean, these are things that publishers great take question. care of. And, would, a, uh, would a foreign publisher be interested in such a contract that is based on something that they might find unethical, right? That this whole thing is based on Ethereum. They might not be interested in that, or they might think, oh, that it, it has uh, kind of uh, overstepped itself and is kind of ungovernable according to the rest of the publishing world. I, I'm not a foreign publisher, I don't know. I would have to I would have to see the contract and we can't. So that's kind of, we're, we're kind of shooting in the dark on that. So, um... And the, the, the one thing we, just to go back a little bit to about, just, there's this idea that there is a concern um, that art is being used as a Trojan horse in terms of kind of, um, what do you call it? Like laundering the credibility of not only, you know, of, of, of cryptocurrency in general and not, not to get down a rabbit hole about this because I did want to focus mainly on the kind of energy consumption responsibility of it and not about the the other things that occur or may not occur or whatever but there is a sense that and, and i think you talked you kind of talked about it a little bit but is there are there other examples of this like i know like in the fine art world i guess in a lot of other art deals with value differently uh fine art um well fine art paintings things like that um, when you get kind of to the more mass produced stuff, there seems to be a number and then that number is just that that just exists. But when we think of value and we think of these NFTs, the value is supposed to be in the there's only, you know, the, the Kings of Leon sold their album as an NFT. And I listened to the whole album yesterday on Apple Music. So I don't get it. But then I looked it up and well, the album, it's not really the album. It's the the NFT is also the kind of freebies and goodies that they they gave people on top of that. Th those are limited. And they said that after, after a two-week period, 
whatever wasn't sold would be, you know, digitally burned or, you know, wouldn't be able to kind of float around there like, like, like that. But it is true that, you know, any other transactions that occur because of the blockchain, it basically seals what happens. When I buy a book from the bookstore, if it's a new West book and, and I sell it at a garage sale for $5, they're not getting any of that money. I'm sorry, Matt, you're not getting any of that money. But in theory, the blockchain can kind of tr track all these transactions that happen with this stuff. But, you know, why does it, why does, why does value, or do you have any kind of thoughts about why value just kind of starts to teeter when we get to more kind of things like maybe a little bit like music or like art uh, or, or uh, like literature and things like that. But it's the, people are getting very excited about the sexiness of a monkey wearing a hat picture that goes for, you know, $10 million or $30 million of, you know, I don't know, I'm just kind of throwing stuff at you at this point. Yeah, no, I mean, we can get real philosophical here in a way, right? Because like, what is value? We, we said that it's kind of a social contract, right? An agreement, it's whatever you'll pay for it. Um, but it's also the case that like, certain things are easier to, to put value in for different reasons, right? Um, part of that is celebrity, part of that is fame. We've, we've touched on that. Um, and then part of it is also like durability, fungibility, um, and uh, 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 the ability to move across borders and, and maybe not be traced. So um, one thing that bears mentioning is that the, the bubble we've seen in, in art-based NFTs, and I call it a bubble because it looks like numbers are trending down now and, and it's not gonna hold the value that it held a month ago. But part of the reasons why there was this explosive interest in digital art is because the regular art world has been shut down and rich people don't have galleries to go to and eat cheese and buy paintings. And people enjoy doing that for many reasons. One of those reasons is, is tax laundering, um, right? Tax evasion and money laundering. Um, it's, it's a really neat thing to buy expensive art and then put it in an offshore storage uh, container and never look at it again. Um, just because it's a good way to, to move money around in ways that isn't totally accountable. Um, but those have been off the table and the European Union in particular just passed a law cutting down on some of those loopholes. So it's kind of a, a, a non, uh, an obvious coincidence, right? That like suddenly now money's moving into digital commodities where things are moving in trustless networks that can't be perfectly uh, traced to people's SIN numbers and tax obligations. So that's definitely part of it. Um, the other part of it is that there's, you know, um, digital artists, artists in general have, you know, have a rough time of it, right? Like it is hard to make a money, uh, make, make a living wage being an artist of any kind. Um, and so like my sympathies go out to folks who are really interested in what this technology might have to offer to that end, right? Like folks who are doing well are doing really well. And um, they've won things through smart contracts that Carfac on the visual arts side here in Canada has been struggling for for like decades, right? To get resale rights, um, resale money out to artists um, who, you know, sell, sell cheap when they're young and then don't benefit um, from resale when they're, when they're old and famous. Um, it's cool that we, we have that option not only on the table, um, but I, I, I do think that um, like all bubbles, a lot of people are going to get hurt in this enthusiasm to, to get rich. Um, and I think a lot of young investors are also going to get burned, um, going to be left with those JPEGs uh, that no one wants to buy. Um, and yeah, it's kind of curious in the case of this novel, because again, like what's being bought and sold here hypothetically isn't the book at all. It's metadata, um, right? It's like that line on the ledger that says that this asset is correlated to this wallet. And that can be totally different from what actually happens to the ebook, what happens to the content of the book. Someone could go ahead and copy and paste, right click every single ebook page on the EPL and put it somewhere else. And it's really not clear that um, extant copyright protection would apply in this case. Um, those the cases haven't gone through the court yet. So there's a kind of gamble. There's a lot of um, performative claims being, making, being made. Um, and yeah, I, I just sort of, you know, worry about where people are going to be when the cards fall. Uh, this, yeah, that's, this is great. And you, you've, everybody is once again, setting me up for the next thing I wanted to, to talk about. So just really quickly, this is from a cryptocurrency company, triple A, 
um, based on a 2021 estimate, 3.9% uh, of people around the world own some cryptocurrency. So it's about 300 million. 79% um, male. 58% uh, are aged under 34. 82% have a bachelor's degree or higher. 30% 36% have an annual income over 100,000 US dollars. Um, India has uh, 100 million cryptocurrency owners. And then USA, 27 million. Nigeria, 13 million. Um, Matt, I want to talk about fairness. And you mentioned and mentioned copyright. I believe you muted yourself there, Jason. Oh, did did anyone hear anything I said? Just your last line. Just say oh, that one again. I wanted to talk about fairness um, with Matt. And um, so the first thing I was going to do, I want to I want to go through. So just a few of the, these tweets that came from the, the conversation. I wrote the book in a place with 100% renewable electricity, and I offset the $100 gas fee for energy use. It's net zero. No paper contracts, no fossil fuels in shipping. A chapbook in YEG, Edmonton, is exponentially dirtier, and soon Ethereum will be carbon neutral. Um, I, I still feel like trying to give everybody the benefit of the, of the doubt, but I don't feel like that is a completely honest phrase. Um, Maybe we don't have time to, to address that. But um, the second thing I was going to so traditional contracts take months or years. This was immediately executed. It's protected on the blockchain, um, which helps copyright, he says. And the process was entirely decentralized, yet it's reaching readers. That's the point. Now, decentralized is a word you're going to hear a lot of when you, uh, if somebody at the club wants to talk crypto with you. Um, Matt, contracts, um, maybe instead of talking about how long contracts take, what is a contract doing for both the publisher and, 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 you know, not to go 101 with us, but like uh, a contract might take a lot of time because it's helping both parties and to protect them and also to compensate them. Yeah, it just kind of lays out a, a groundwork for what happens in a bunch of different scenarios. And um, I could see some very high level um, contracts that might involve different language rights, different publishers in every language, different uh, formats like audiobook and everything. That might take a while, but years and months seems a little bit excessive. Um, we, you know, it's, they're kind of standard and then your agent looks at it and then you kind of say, I, I want to keep that, I want to keep that, someone else is buying that, that kind of thing. But it does kind of just set up the, the framework by which the relationship uh, between the publisher and the author is established. Uh, it's kind of like getting into a business partnership with somebody. You want to know what they're looking out of the arrangement and what you're looking out of the arrangement. Um, with with regards to this NFT sale of a book, I would say it's almost like getting a very, very big royalty advance of $8,000 is pretty good for Canadian publishing. Um, uh, Babiak is published with large multinational corporations, so he may have seen numbers like that as well, but I would say that most Canadian authors will never see a royalty advance like eight grand in their life. Like that's, you could see that much coming to you in royalties if your book does well and is on, that wins awards and is you know popular for years. Like, yeah, you could reach that eventually, but he got a really good royalty advance and then you only had to get one person to like the book. So that's kind of one guaranteed one sale and it works. Um, I would be curious to know about um, lots of the clauses that we think of like, uh, what happens when the author dies? Where do those rights go? Uh, contracts tell you that. It could be going to the executor of the estate. It could be going to their children. It's in there. Like It, it gives you a framework to figure that sort of thing out. Um, but yeah, it's exclusivity without exclusivity, right? Like maybe there's some sort of mythical value to be gained by being the one person who has the key to the to unlock this story which as i understand it's kind of like a which is harry potter type thing right that's kind of the gist of it um but uh, they also mentioned movie rights i believe was uh, something and uh i can't imagine a film studio would be very interested in a book that has had um you know one person buy it and then a lot of people re read it for free like uh, what about merchandising rights? Like, can people make derivative works based on this book? 
Um, this is why I think of the Creative Commons that has clauses for all this kind of stuff and isn't uh, tied to carbon extraction as much, you know? Um, and so like it's it, fairness. Yeah, I'm sure it was an extremely fair transaction of here's to Ethereum for your book, do with it what you will. And it is attractive in the sense that it's one and done. And then also you get a little chunk of each transaction down the line. I just, you know, uh, personally, I just don't understand the utility of this apart from novelty at this point. Yeah, I get, I get. And I think, you know, um, where I work at the Writers Guild of Alberta, uh, we have a lot of people that ask us questions every year about copyright and they're worried about getting their work stolen. Um, which is a, I find a very difficult thing to talk about a thing that may happen. Um, but also uh, I did a little bit, it was hard. I did a little bit of research once again on the Google um, copyright infringement lawsuits in the United States are down and they're trending down. Um, once again, that's not for art. That's just all copyright infringement lawsuits. But I think that Matt, the, 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 the kind of the copyright infringement that people think is going to happen to them is probably a lot less likely but the copyright problems that you deal with and what access copyright deals with um, are probably uh, more egregious. Do you want to just talk a little bit about the copyright issues that, so I don't know if Todd's, if Todd Babiak's book, um, when he says the, the, his contract being on the blockchain helps with copyright and Ann said, maybe this hasn't been tested in a court yet about somebody kind of taking it. Or like you said, maybe they make a story with characters from the book and then what happens if fan fiction is published afterwards. Um, it goes on and on and on, but um, can you just talk a little bit about the, the copyright kind of infringement problem that is actually occurring every day? Sure. I would be interested to know if this book falls under the copyright regime of Australia and does Tasmania have its own? Like, because it, it is created in that uh, place. Because uh, in Canada, basically copyright, when you write in the copyright page, like uh, this book is, uh, you know, C symbol, Jason Lee Norman, 2022, then that is the what we point to It's AC. It is copyrighted now. Uh, it's different in the States. You can kind of apply for that. And you can also apply here, but technically it's like, as soon as you write it down, it, it is currently copyrighted. I would say that most uh, people writing books in Canada probably don't have to worry about the sort of copyright infringement of having their books stolen. Like it's, you would have to reach a pretty high bar of interest from the general population in order to actually get it stolen. It's not like uh, artists who are right now having their like uh, you know uh, drawing artists their who are NFTs having their work are getting stolen. Yeah. Well, they're having their work turned into NFTs without their knowledge. And right? there's that yes, they're getting minted, yeah. which is another issue. Yeah. Yeah. So if we ever run into a situation where people are having their books turned into NFTs without their permission, well, that could get really interesting, especially uh, with uh, people self-publishing or something where there isn't really uh, any sort of apparatus to defend them. They're just kind of putting it out there on their own and running into this problem. Um, but uh, the the main problem that Canadian authors have with copyright is that uh, universities and um, uh, government organizations are using uh, authors work without paying for it. So that's uh, that is a 10 year problem that the last conservative government put into place by uh, looking at the Copyright Act and changing the uh, meaning of uh, fair dealing. So uh, don't have time to go into that, but essentially universities have a very broad sense of how much of a work you could uh, use in a course pack or uh, in a learning management system uh, that most people would think is probably a bit egregious if you sat down and think about it. Uh, so universities are using Canadian authors work without permission and not paying them. So that is the more that is the bigger copyright problem I could see authors in this country dealing with. And that's why New West books were part of Access Copyright. And the idea is that um, people who want to use the book for educational purposes can just pay for a license to do it like we used to before the, the ruling in 2012. And right now it's looking like the new government will actually try and deal with this problem, which is very good news because in the courts, it hasn't gone particularly well for publishers. Um, but uh, something interesting was that the conservative government actually made it part of the party platform that they would uh, specifically do, do this. Whereas liberals say that authors will be, you know, um, handled or whatever, like we'll, we'll figure it out. It wasn't really as concrete as the conservatives. So, um, so that is kind of the big copyright problem that uh, 
uh, your authors in uh, Canada are dealing with not so much people stealing your work. We occasionally see things on pirate sites, but how many people do you know who even just go buy pirated, e like find pirated eBooks? Like, it's not like Napster back in the day when you would go find a song because you were in high school and didn't have any money and didn't have a way to find it. It's more like there's millions of free books out there all the time. You can just go to the library and get them or, you know, go on Kindle Direct or whatever. Like the accessibility isn't the issue anymore. It's um, being found in a crowded marketplace. Uh, so yeah, that well, was a think, long, rambling uh, response to your question. I'm sorry. No, that's great. And I think this is uh, the last thing that one of the things that he said, the whole thing is an engine, the, uh, is an engine of decentralization. That's what I like about it. This is what Todd said about his project. The prospects for literature are deeply interesting, new ways to find audiences. Um, I would be, I would be interested in, in hearing what the last word from you might be on that. I don't know what these new ways of finding audiences are. I guess it's true. Once you release a book as an NFT for the first time, you'll get more media coverage than a lot of Edmonton authors have gotten over the past year. Um, and, um, but once again, the thing I'm concerned about is it's publicity for a book that he may he may never see royalties on. Um, so I'm very it's just kind of like, did did he maybe stop this experiment too soon? Um, and maybe w he, letting the NFT maybe live in the in the metaverse for a little while might have been able we could have actually seen what the possibilities were. But selling it and then kind of donating it, we've kind of you know, everything is kind of stopped um, there. But I don't know, Matt, if you see like, to try to give, or Anne, what do you have, what do you have there? I, I was just gonna say that, you know, the book ending in a library is is a fantastic happy ending. Um, I, I think that benefits almost everyone, maybe not the author, um, but uh, I can't I can't be sad about that. Um, no, I, I think it's a real puzzle for, for particularly writers, right? Like, um, one of the reasons why art has value is that it can be a way of expressing your personality by having it on your wall or being seen as a cool rich person who has expensive things um, to associate themselves with. And there's a way in which, um, you know, like Twitter with the hexagon um, icons is, is moving to make that a use case of your NFT. So you can be seen as a distinct upper echelon sort of person which we know based on the demographics that you laid out, Jason, right? Like is sort of market. Um, uh, one of the reasons why these are being bought. Um, uh, another reason why they're being bought is celebrity endorsements. And, and you know, it leads to a market for artists where um, there's a lot of people paying gas fees to go nowhere and just a very small group of people who are extremely uh, successful. So I, I would especially worry for young writers who um, are very unlikely to collaborate with Justin Bieber on an NFT drop and uh, who would be trying to reach an artist that's looking to display what they've purchased more so than to enjoy it. And, and it just seems like that's an awkward fit for literature. Um, I could be wrong, of course, but um, I again, it, it may not be the solution for the problem. <laughs> Yeah, I, I want to uh, invite if anybody has uh, a question or two, we could probably have time to, to get to one or two of those. The one thing I thought, so if, if we didn't make this obvious uh, before, an NFT can only exist because of the blockchain and the blockchain can only exist because of crypto. So we can't just be like, wouldn't it be great to create an NFT that was uh, not on that? I mean, in the in the way that it exists, it has to be hand in hand with cryptocurrency. Um, anything else is just kind of... Um, you know, unbanked, uh, just kind of like uh, barter system transaction world. But um, so, because I think there are there are some interesting things about um, if you could if you could separate the two from each other and say, well, at least I didn't contribute all of this carbon to to create this this token of a picture of a of a monkey with a hat on. You know, at least I could say it because like I was I think what we talked about before the the session started was that. Um, Every transaction um, on the blockchain for either Ethereum or Bitcoin uses a, a certain amount of energy, which is quite a bit of energy. But the other problem is the blockchain keeps adding blocks because the blockchain needs to have these blocks to verify these transactions that are happening. Um, so it's it's kind of like a thing that just keeps needing to, to happen for whatever the purpose of whatever that is is. Um, but you know, I'm just thinking about. Um, 
anyway, I lost my I lost my train of thought again. But it was about the <laughs> it was about just trying to see if Matt had. But if anybody has any questions, you can type them in. If you have a hand up, I can't see. But no, I, I don't think anybody does. Um, and people didn't have to go out at seven two. Um, thinking of trying to give any credit where credit's due in terms of obviously the publicity. There's the check mark there. Um, the idea of a smart contract, I mean, in your mind, would would it be nice to, oh, I, this is the, the thing I was going to ask you, it was about value. You, New West might not create an NFT anytime soon, but if if a New West Press author, oh, maybe you are, sorry. It, oh, okay, you're not, okay, sorry. Uh, if a New West Press author, let's say, wins uh, a national award, like, like the Giller, um, why not make those books uh, more money? or a signed copy, why not charge more money for them? Because it has more value. And why don't publishers already do that? Um, because is, is, it, is it our fault? Is it the artist's fault that we don't put the value on the things we should? Or is it, is it, is it just about decency? Um, if you sent everybody a, a signed photograph of, uh, of the author, like doesn't that add value to the book? Shouldn't you be able to charge more for the book and make more money? OK, well, cynically, I guess I would say that the average Canadian person doesn't really buy that many Canadian books anyway. So regardless of if it wins the Giller or not, like the the problem is getting the people of this country to appreciate the literature that we are creating and like um, interact with it. Uh, by the way, have we seen any reviews of this uh, NFT book? I haven't. Uh, I'd be curious to know if anyone has uh, put it on their Goodreads or is it going to get... Uh, published in uh, Global Mail or anything, apart from the novelty of its existence, is the actual substance of the story going to be examined at all and, you know, viewed in, you know, his his canon of works or in the sort of YA genre. Like the, the kind of exclusivity there, uh, needing to have an EPL, um, <laughs> needing to have an EPL access in order to read this, to review it, that kind of does section it off from a lot of the country as well. You could do an interlibrary loan, possibly, that might also fall under the contract. But um, I think you do see some exclusivity in the publishing world. Uh, you can look at something like um, uh, Gaspero Press or I think it's Porcupine's Quill, those places that do letterpress, um, like hand printed uh, books. They do have a little bit of a premium of them, but they're like beautiful works that are not printed very much, like small quantities. That's the sort of NFT I enjoy, the kind of like handmade, um, tangible work. Um, why don't uh, publishers raise their price after the Giller though? Um, they kind of do. They'll put out like a special edition afterwards or they'll do like, oh, here's the expanded edition with an interview with the author or here's the movie cover edition. like. Um, I would say that the Giller probably just gets you more attention and gets people to buy the book rather than, oh, here's the exclusive picture of the author because you could just, it's like an NFT. You could find a picture of the author online and print it and put it on your wall if you want to. Uh, it's not, it's not a, uh, it, it is fungible. It is not something that is difficult to find. Um, but uh, if, uh, if one of my authors was interested in doing an NFT, I would be there's some ethical concerns there because I wouldn't want to be associated with that project. And if um, Claire Kelly, our marketing and production coordinator, brought this up, but uh, uh, do you tell the editors, do you tell the cover designer, do you tell the photographer of the uh, author picture that they're being involved in this? They may have ethical qualms too, and they may not want to have their work associated with this. Or do you tell them after the fact when it's when it's a fait accompli? Like, um, there's a lot to keep in mind on this. Uh, and I don't want to be some sort of techno skeptic, but uh, it's hard enough to get people to buy normal books as opposed to ones that you have to learn how to purchase cryptocurrency, getting a MetaMask wallet, then going on OpenSea. Like there's so many steps in the transaction that are not present in normal book transactions that your average person who is not a crypto weirdo is just not going to do those. They'll just like, never look at it. Uh, that's the reason why that book's in the library, by the way. If it was just in the owner's hands, uh, like your average person would just never be interested in finding out about it. No one's going to buy it off them, I don't think. Uh, not unless 
they can make some use case for this book, which has been put in the library, needs to be purchased by another person for X reason. Like that, I don't think there's going to be any more transactions on this. So yeah, I, I don't see a business case for this unless you're a person who needs to unload cryptocurrency because you bought it when it was low and you want to sell it when it's high. So you invent NFTs as a way to get normal people to try and buy into the system as a, as a token that appears to have value, but is in fact sort of a URL pointing at a picture on a, on a website. It's not, you don't actually get the digital file either. It's basically like the digital file lives here. You own the, the, the map. That is uh, true. Sticker you don't actually, that is true. You own the, you own the map to the location of the, the yeah. thing. You don't actually, even the digital thing, you don't actually have it. Yeah. yeah um, it's like, I, uh, it's like what Mwadib says in Dune with someone who can, who, can, who uh, who possesses a thing, controls a thing. So like Labossier could uh, just delete the file entirely and take it away from the library. That's one of the few things that he could potentially do to this work of art and no one would ever see it again. That is something that could happen. I don't think it will, but like that's one of the, one of the joys, I guess, of buying a literature NFT is that you could destroy it and have no one could ever see it again. So that's something. That's what Banksy would do probably. Uh, and yeah. I, wanna, I wanna give you the last word on, um basically anything but i i guess one of the questions i had from the beginning was does this matter when when this this conversation came up and we say no your thing is not good because we worry about the 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 carbon footprint and someone else does a what about your industry or where you live in the world and you know we all wish we could live in in a place where we could say you know the energy it took me to create this thing uh is zero um and, you know, we all wish we could be there. We all live in the places that we live. We all strive for a better future and a cleaner world and, and, and air and all that stuff. Uh, does this matter? Are these the questions that we should be asking? Uh, is it wrong to, well, it's probably wrong to just yell at people on Twitter, but um, is this the right, is this the right question to ask? And how much is, F, you know, like, do people need to do their research with just about everything and, and make their own kind of is this just another one of those things we need to kind of make your own do it, you know, spend an hour on Google and figure out how, what you think about it? Yeah, I, I think it's it's important for two reasons and, and both kind of exceed any one given transaction. So if you've bought an NFT, you know, I won't think ill of you. Um, we can call that, you know, something that happened in, in a weak moment of, of naivete and excitement, whatever it may be. But I think it matters, um, again, for the climate impacts of it, right? These are not um, currently catastrophic, but they, they are alarming and they are, they are trending in the wrong direction and sort of pulling against the, the rope of the climate mitigation fight we should be in. So um, you don't love to see it. Um, but I also think this matters because there's a, there's a deeper story here about how artists get paid. And I, I don't think that this is the way I want this story to end, right? The, the proposition here is to make art into a financial asset that's tradable and, and may appreciate in value in ways that benefit both the artist and the investors. But that's only ever going to benefit a really small section of the arts and certain kinds of arts that, you know, appeal to certain kinds of moneyed investors. Um, in this case, crypto bros, right? Which is a, a strange magnet to pull uh, the art world towards. Um, I, I think it matters because we should solve this problem differently. Um, we should think about modes of patronage from the state, from um, your fans in ways that are sustaining. We could think about universal basic income as, as a better option than you know um, doing an NFT drop, um, getting a bunch of ether and then question mark figuring out what to do with it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't want to play only the environmental card because they're, they're all entangled and hopefully there's a way that we can do right by the climate and do right by our artists in a much more sustaining way. Uh, I will, I will end there. I think that is a, a fantastic place to end it. I cannot thank you, uh, both enough for, for joining me in this, in this conversation. Um, it, it was fantastic to talk to you and thank you very much for, for taking the time, Matt, thank you for taking the time as well. Um, thank you very much for watching. Uh, we'll have the, the, the recording up uh, for, for you to, to, to watch. And, um, you know, I, I just think uh, I would like to have a we need to talk about series where I just send David an email and I say we need to talk about this and we make a series about it. But uh, I think these are great questions. This is a great place to kind of 
um, you know, take this energy and, and people can do their own research and, and they can, uh, you know, be safe out there when it comes to, you know, investing and, and, and all of that. But also we do try to care as much as we can about, about the environment. So thank you uh, very much. I owe you both big time. So if you ever need a favor, you need a couch moved, uh, give me a call. I owe you. Uh, it's been, it's been very great to have you and spending uh, any amount of time, even on zoom. I, I know it's, it's, uh, it's not nothing. So thank you again. And thank you everyone for watching and uh, take care. That's it. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Good night all. Good night.